Hi, everyone. Thank you for um, uh, attending this, uh, this talk. And uh, Eric et al., thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm an associate professor in radiology and neuroscience. Um, I'm uh, the director of advanced neuroimaging research here at Sinai and associate director of BIMI, which is the Biomedical Engineering and Imaging Institute. I'm gonna talk about visualizing the brain at seven Tesla. And uh, this talk will consist of just showing what is possible um, using our advanced technology, but also how we've applied it to several different diseases and disorders, a subset of the diseases and disorders we've applied it to because we are in a translational institute. Um, and if I didn't introduce my name, I'm Preeti Baljanani. Um, so just a few relationships that I need to disclose. Um, I am a seed investor in a company on radiation therapy and also have patents that have been licensed by uh, several companies on MRI. So this is our, uh, this is just an overview slide showing all of the equipment that is available for research use as part of our Biomedical Engineering and Imaging Institute. This includes the seven Tesla human scanner and uh, multiple other scanners uh, as well as animal imaging equipment. And I'm just gonna switch quickly to uh, just our website here. Um, Letting you know that, uh, you know, in tandem with all of the um, renewed guidelines on, on human subjects research, we've been ramping up um, so that this is available for use. Uh, imaging uh, research uh, can begin and with, with um, you know, a, a, a form that is submitted to the IRB to ramp up. And we have uh, really taken care to ensure that all of the guidelines are met, that precautions are taken for safe and, um, uh, and uh, san sanitary um, uh, performing of imaging research. Um, and this is all available online. Um, you're welcome to you know, get in touch with me or Christopher Conestresi or Zahi Fayad um, if you have any further questions, but overall we're ready and, um, and can begin uh, imaging research with a few uh, additional precautions and um, you know, guidelines for mask wearing and social distancing. Okay, um, by the way, if anyone has questions for me throughout this presentation. Um, you can just chime in at any time. Um, okay, so uh, I'm gonna focus on the 7T. It is a, a higher magnetic field MRI scanner than what is currently available in the clinic, and that is three Tesla and 1.5 Tesla, Tesla being a unit for magnetic field strength. And it's perfectly safe for human use and um, now has been um, approved by the FDA for clinical use. It has received 510K approval in October 2017. So our scanner is the version right before the model that has received approval, but all of the um, hardware parameters and functionality of the scanner is very similar. So generally, 7T research is becoming more and more widely available and um, is valuable in certain diseases and disorders where we're actually, um, you know, we don't have non-invasive diagnostic imaging methods that are sensitive enough and have high enough resolution to capture some of the abnormalities that may be leading to the symptoms that we're observing. So I'll be touching upon that. This is all uh, you know, at the Hess Center. Um, so what can we do at 7T? Um, number one, we have increased signal to noise ratio, um, and that's just um, 
because of the increased magnetic field strength, there's more signal coming from the protons in the body. And so we're able to leverage this to have higher resolution anatomical images. You can really visualize the cortex in great detail, the gray white matter boundary, um, details within the white matter, and uh, structures such as the hippocampus that are important in many different diseases and disorders. Mm -hmm. On the right, I show the hippocampus and how well we can delineate subregions of, uh, of the hippocampus and uh, subfields. We can actually uh, quantify the volumes of these subfields using automated segmentation methods, and these become um, really sort of sensitive markers of any kind of atrophy of these regions and um, could be sensitive markers for a wide range of different diseases, including epilepsy and uh, depression, where there's uh, potential neurotoxic effects causing cellular loss in these regions. We can also uh, look at vessels in um, higher detail at this field strength. The, these are arteriograms that are achieved by performing time of flight and geography. Time of flight and geography uses uh, spins that are tagged in, um, in a tagging plane for arteries feeding the brain and then we can see these vessels in the imaging uh, plane and at 7T because the signal to noise is greater but also the relaxation times are different, we can see smaller branches of the arteries that feed the brain and this becomes valuable in several different applications. We can also look at veins in great detail and this leverages the fact that veins have deoxygenated blood that's paramagnetic and therefore there is a higher contrast um, there's a higher susceptibility uh, contrast at 7T, which can be leveraged to um, visualize tiny venules in the cortex and, and also hemorrhagic uh, regions and um, any kind of blood product or microbleeds. We can segment these vessels using automated segmentation methods and quantify the numbers of these vessels in um, certain regions. This was a, this was a uh, experiment performed where we looked at the vasculature in the hippocampus in particular in patients with epilepsy versus healthy controls and there was a, a difference seen in the hippocampus. This is the first time this type of study was performed and has been published. Um, for diffusion-weighted imaging, uh, many of you may be familiar with the fact that looking at the diffusion of spins, sp by spins I mean protons and hydrogen uh, in the water of our, uh, making up our body. Um, anyway, diffusion is a method, diffusion MRI is a method that actually captures the diffusivity of these um, water molecules and one can actually uh, look at this in much more granular detail uh, at seven Tesla versus um, lower field strengths. And then this can be taken, this information of the diffusivity of the spins can be taken to create tractography or tracks to um, estimate the neuronal fiber connections um, or the bundles of axons that connect up the brain. We can uh, be a lot more um, granular in the seeding of these tracks. So um, with this high resolution segmentation as well as high resolution diffusion, we can look at tracks emerging from important structures such as the amygdala. And um, we can even look at the tracks emerging from the nuclei of the amygdala, the, the subnuclei, since the amygdala is made uh, of 13 distinct subnuclei. We can look at tracks emerging from subfields of the hippocampus. Here is a um, image of, uh, of all the tracks coming out of the hippocampus uh, shown in this panel and then tracks emerging specifically from uh, a subfield of the hippocampus. Um, and so we can actually uh, really be very 
um, specific um, about what we're studying and look at changes and variations in subregions of important structures. All of these, I think, are firsts in the field right now and um, really are ready to be used um, to study different kinds of diseases. We've, stu we've uh, performed this kind of work in epilepsy and depression, um, but they're quite applicable in many different diseases and disorders. Um, we also look at whole brain connectivity. So here I'm showing connectivity um, computed using our diffusion weighted MRI as well as resting seat functional MRI and the segmentation performed using automated methods such as FreeSurfer to create connectivity matrices, but then to yield um, the actual quantitative metrics that allow us to perform analyses such as graph theory analysis. Um, and this allows us to really look at specific metrics that could indicate abnormal connectivity or network um, characteristics. And these uh, types of uh, uh, connectivity matrices can be used to uh, create connectomes and uh, we can get a sense of whether there's any kind of neuroplasticity occurring over time courses to see if the connectome actually changes. This is an analysis that was performed in a patient who uh, had a traumatic brain injury and we have um, pre and post imaging data on this person and there were several connections that were weakened in the brain and we were able to actually detect that using this kind of connectomic analysis um, which uh, we are soon to publish after um, after correlation with neuropsych measures um, sorry about that um, another thing that MRI can be used for or uh, MR scanners can be used for is actually to look at the biochemistry of tissue and look at metabolites and main uh, biochemical pathways. And that is done using MR spectroscopy. At 7 Tesla, we have a twofold advantage or higher field strengths. We have a twofold advantage. One is increased signal to noise. The other one is increased separation between metabolite peaks. And these metabolites are hydrogen containing molecules other than water that actually are important in many cell processes and indicative of some disease processes. This is a, a spectrum that has been obtained at a one centimeter isotropic uh, voxel resolution from the hippocampus on the left and right hippocampus. And we can observe important metabolites such as choline, creatine, N-acetyl aspartate, or NAA. Uh, NAA is an indicator of neuronal density or neuronal um, function, and choline and creatine indicate cell proliferation, membrane, um, membrane turnover. So the, the choline peak is often reduced in the case of cancer, uh, sorry, uh, raised in the case of cancer, while the NAA peak is reduced. And so we can use these to uh, better understand metabolic variations within the brain, but also metabolic variations that underlie the structural changes and may occur earlier than structural changes that are pathological. Okay, so if I'm gonna dive into one of the applications that we uh, perform 7T imaging for and uh, this is a funded R1 grant where we look at 7T imaging applications in the skull base, specifically cell, skull base tumors. These are my collaborators. Uh, I just want to quickly pause for any questions. Okay, um, don't hear anyone. So um, I will move forward with 7T imaging applications in the skull base. Um, here, we, we aim to improve the neurosurgical resection of skull base tumors. These are tumors arising around the skull base. Uh, the, these include, the, include pituitary adenomas in the pituitary gland, uh, meningiomas, craniopharyngiomas, 
and they actually comprise of a large portion of intracranial lesions. But uh, often they're not malignant. They can be malignant and, and, and uh, spreading fast, but often they are not. They're growing slowly, but causing compressive symptoms, which, um, which causes reduced neurological function or affects certain neurological functions, such as vision, hearing, uh, cause facial pain or numbness or headaches. The primary symptom actually is vision loss. So we did do a, quite a bit of work on trying to understand vision loss from these tumors. They are located in, uh, in a region that is very close to delicate structures, such as uh, the cranial nerve, specifically the optic nerve and arteries. Now these um, structures, if they are damaged in the resection of the tumor, there could be uh, really much greater complications and consequences than the tumor's effect itself. So they pose complex challenges in neurosurgery. And historically, the resection approaches have been uh, quite invasive and elaborative uh, and elaborate. Um, and so um, what people have really shifted towards uh, is performing endoscopic endonasal approaches. And this is through the use of an endoscope, which is a device that illuminates a cavity and, can, and there, you can perform all aspects of neurosurgery, the approach, resection, um, reconstruction, all through a use of uh, this endoscopic camera with surgical devices um, attached to it. And um, this is great because it actually re uh, results in very minimally invasive surgeries that don't involve um, a incision or, um, in a or a skin incision or craniotomy, and therefore can really reduce trauma, decrease morbidity and mortality, and shorten hospital stays. Um, however, they uh, require image guidance to really um, minimize those complications I was talking about earlier, which is damage to those associated structures. Um, so um, I'm, I'm talking about important vessels that seem to be encased in these tumors. And MRI actually allows us to really visualize those structures and and project them on neuro navigation screen screen so that the actual surgery can be performed uh, much more safely with higher confidence levels. Uh, here I'm showing a 7T image actually of a very large pituitary adenoma. We performed 7T imag imaging on the subject and the surrounding uh, vessels as well as vessels that were feeding the tumor. Uh, were really, really conspicuously uh, seen using our, our anatomical imaging. Areas of firmness and softness in the tumor were also visualized well. Um, these arrows indicate, for example, the blue and green arrows show these feeding arteries and veins, draining veins. Uh, the purple arrow indicates an area of firmness. And then there's compressed surrounding uh, structures uh, uh, which, which are so tiny because they're so compressed that are not really visualized well with um, clinical field strengths. Again, all of these things are very subtle and um, tiny structures that could really help in making decisions during surgery and, and, and also in improved neurosurgical planning. Um, on the bottom right is a time of flight image showing the displacement of arteries due to this tumor. And so it's very, very informative for us to understand what's happening with the vessels. Here's a meningioma that we scanned using 7T and we had a time of flight image as well as an anatomical image. And the overlay of one um, of, the, of the time of flight image on top of the anatomical image is quite valuable in getting a sense of important vessels that are adjacent to the tumor that's marked by an asterisk here. 
Again, these can be projected on screens during surgery, but also used for planning of neurosurgical approach. This is the first experiment we've performed on contrast enhanced MRI at seven Tesla. Um, contrast enhanced MRI of skull based lesions has not been performed at seven Tesla in the past, but we found that it was quite valuable in really illuminating tumor, pituitary adenoma in this case, uh, indicated by the white arrow and all of these different metrics from, um, from a contrast enhanced image versus normal pituitary gland. So we actually don't know what the advantages would be of performing contrast enhanced imaging at higher field strengths. We know that there's higher resolution that can be leveraged for the anatomical images, um, but could there be also enhanced contrast using gadolinium? Uh, so that actually is um, something that we will ascertain doing work like this. That being said, having it as part of the main neurological protocol makes the protocol more complete. And, uh, and so we have integrated it. So this is how it looks in the neurosurgical uh, suite. We basically have images um, projected on a neuro navigation screen and the instruments, the surgical instruments are co-registered onto these images using infrared markers. These markers are placed on the bony anatomy and then the uh, CT is co-registered to the MRI in order to localize the instruments. And on the, in the middle screen, you'll see the endoscopic image, which is really very difficult to determine the entire structure and is very much a pulpy mess, although surgeons are skilled enough to understand what's going on using that screen alone and synthesize the information from these multiple screens, the CT, the MRI, the um, endoscopic camera view in order to make millimeter uh, level uh, decisions, um, which will resect tumor tissue, but not completely damage important nerves such as the optic nerve and chiasm. Here's another image of that. And um, 70 images can be uh, displayed on these screens. And we can also look at things in 3D using newer neuro, uh, uh, neuro navigation software. So we're working with these companies in order to, to best project these images and also project fused images. So the fused images of time of flight showing the arteries on top of the anatomical images is something that we want to perform. We want to also have overlays of diffusion tractography. Um, and one can ask the question, how do we actually ascertain whether this is helping? We actually were very systematic about it and had uh, scales in which we recorded the improvement in depiction of important structures surrounding the tumor, as well as improvement in neurosurgical approach, as well as um, uh, the uh, decision-making in the operating room. This is just showing what we found when we looked at the detectability of nerves and vessels in the images. And uh, indeed, there was a statistically significant uh, improvement when uh, looking at these structures at 7T versus 3T or 1.5T, and this work has been published. But beyond the utility of 7T in actually helping with surgical care, again, these kind of things have not really been explored in the past, and we're uh, hoping to really increase the use of the 7T in this respect. But beyond that, beyond the utility in surgical treatment, it also allows us to get a sense of what the downstream or remote effects would be of some of these lesions. So because these lesions are actually impinging upon the optic chiasm and optic nerves, um, we do see problems with vision, but what happens in the entire optic apparatus? So we actually look at every imaging marker of any kind of um, loss of integrity or degradation of these structures. Uh, we look at the optic chiasms with, we look at the uh, visual cortex cortical thickness. We look at the diffusion um, metrics of 
fractional anisotropy or a mean diffusivity along tracks in the optic track as well as optic radiation. Um, so basically the entire optic apparatus is studied for these patients for pituitary adenoma. And it was found that there is actually white matter injury in these uh, pathways, these secondary pathways that are quite remote, spatially from the area of the tumor, where there is an increased uh, fractional anisotropy for patients that are in blue versus blue that are in red, and a reduced mean diffusivity overall as we track these, uh, uh, these uh, different pathways in the brain. We also studied um, any changes in, uh, in, in structures that may be involved in the relay of this information. So again, going back to vision, the uh, lateral genic geniculate nucleus uh, is the main relay for visual um, information in the thalamus, and it's tiny, uh, but it was studied in great detail for these patients, and, and here is uh, the LGN in a control versus a patient. It's very hard to see and tiny, but visible at 7 Tesla by a skilled neuroradiologist um, versus at lower field strength. So the morphological characteristics of this, the size of this structure was evaluated for patients versus controls. Um, our Scientific illustrators who are quite gifted at depicting what we want to try and do in MRI have made this uh, diagram for us to uh, really visually see what we're trying to look for. And the effect is a reduced size of the LGN in patients with pituitary adenoma. And that was indeed found uh, in our data set for the first time. And then uh, here was another study performed um, by uh, all of the Many of the studies I'm uh, talking about were first author, Jack Rutland, who is a medical student here at Sinai. Um, and this particular study was very, very uh, interesting. And I think the first time it was performed where we look at the thickness of the cortex in the, in, in the visual cortex, uh, which can be evaluated in great detail and quantitatively at 7 Tesla, and then connect it to visual field defects. So there's a one-to-one -one, uh, retinotopic mapping that can be performed in this op uh, ophthalmological measure um, between actual an MRI uh, imaging metric and this visual field defect map. Um, again, correlations were found between this, uh, this cortical thicknesses and, 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 um, in, and defects in the in the visual field as, as measured in their ophthalmological exam for these patients. So very interesting findings um, in the skull-based lesions. We also actually tried to um, see if this kind of uh, technical development that we performed in order to improve the, improve the visualization of structures in the skull base could be applicable to other skull based pathology. And indeed, we did find that it's helpful in certain conditions here is uh, one that we studied tr uh, called trigeminal neuralgia. And this is a chronic brain condition characterized by spasmic shocking facial pains. Um, this uh, disease actually is rare, but it is often misdiagnosed and the etiology is very misunderstood. It is so painful that it is often referred to as the uh, suicide disease. And there's a lack of convergence on what is leading to the source of pain. We know that it involves the trigeminal complex, which is um, uh, part of which is the trigeminal nerve, which um, is involved in, in uh, sensation in the face. And um, we found that with our very high resolution imaging, as well as multimodal imaging that looks at vessels as well as anatomy, we could really depict this nerve in great detail, specifically, here's the nerve, um, specifically in the area that we think it is most um, uh, relevant to trigeminal neuralgia pathology, and that is when the nerve is entering from Meckel's cave into the pons. Um, there's a wide range of reasons why uh, 
this nerve could be dysfunctioning and one is the fact that there's a vessel that potentially is impinging upon the nerve and this is called microvascular compression this if we can find it if we can find this particular nerve vessel interaction then we can actually uh, have a surgical intervention that could separate those two structures and potentially relieve people of these um, debilitating symptoms. And that, that surgery is, is, is one of the main uh, surgeries that's performed for these patients, although the, the, the pain could be caused through numerous reasons, including multiple sclerosis um, and uh, there being an injury or a lesion. Again, all of these things could be better depicted using our qualitative and quantitative imaging at seven Tesla. So what we have also done is for the uh, first time really done very, very um, accurate nerve tractography of the trigeminal nerve as again, it emerges into, uh, f from the pons into Meckel's cave and it, it di differentiates into three different branches, ophthalmic, maxillary, and mandibular. And we performed uh, a a diffusion tractography to try and really limit the fibers to the nerve so that we can look at the integrity of the nerve through these diffusion metrics as well. And then we, we can actually depict nerve and vessels quite well, as I showed earlier. And so it's possible to really identify those, uh, those interactions or, or uh, mechanical intervention, but uh, mechanical impingement of the nerve by a surrounding vessel. Again, as we did with our skull-based lesions, we looked for downstream effects that were remote from the actual pathology. And even though the trigeminal nerve is in the area I showed earlier in the skull base, uh, because of the fact that the thalamus um, is really involved uh, and somatosensory cortex is involved in sensation, we performed, we performed um, a analysis of whether or not tracks connecting the thalamus to the somatosensory cortex are affected by uh, this condition. And uh, uh, Jack Rutland found that there was actually a uh, difference in the affected side, the side that the spasmic facial pain was happening versus the unaffected side for the somatosensory thalamic connections as shown here. Uh, we can now differentiate the thalamus into its subnuclei. Um, and so we will be performing subnuclei specific diffusion tractography to other regions in the brain as well. So there's definitely a difference in FA and MD on the affected side versus the unaffected side. Uh, and, and therefore the microstructural integrity of these tracks is getting affected. And again, these are, these are effects that are downstream uh, outside of the uh, immediate area where we feel there is a um, mass effect on, on the nerve. Okay, so before I move on to the next application, any questions on that? Okay. All right. So we can also apply 7T to epilepsy. And uh, this, I think, is one of the first, first applications that most schools that have or institutions that have the FDA approved version of the 7T scanner are um, trying in a patient population. And we were basically performing this with our epilepsy team. They're listed, many of whom are listed here. Um, for the last seven years. And um, this is because epilepsy, uh, as we know, is a, a disease that affects a large number of people worldwide, 50 million people worldwide. And uh, unfortunately, 40% of these patients actually fail to respond to anti-seizure medication. And these account for most of the disease burden and 80% uh, of the cost of this. And um, in these patients, there is actually an opportunity to help and that is through surgical options. Um, conventionally, historically, the surgical uh, treatment options were resective surgery, which continue till this day to be quite effective. Um, but there have been new minimally invasive 
uh, methods as well that are, have been introduced. Um, and these could be really great options for certain patients, including laser ablation, uh, vagus nerve stimulation, responsive neurostimulation, and deep brain stimulation. This could reduce the seizure burden significantly. And um, it would, uh, magnetic resonance imaging exams are actually crucial in determining whether or not there is actually a region of the brain or a circuit that can be identified for these surgical interventions. Unfortunately, clinical MRI actually does not reveal seizure foci in 20 to 30 percent of these DRE patients, and, and the outcomes for these patients are, are considerably um, uh, lower, so lower uh, seizure freedom. So um, we want to come up with a non-invasive way to really reveal and bring above the threshold of detectability some of these very tiny gray matter abnormalities that could be the source of seizure um, formation and propagation. That's where the 7T multimodal imaging comes in. We can actually perform very high resolution T1 weighted imaging, T2 weighted imaging to capture the uh, range of abnormalities that usually lead to seizure formation. That includes hippocampal abnormalities, uh, cortical abnormalities, and um, small tiny lesions. Susceptibility weighted imaging, I showed you earlier an image of veins. This actually is a useful modality to look at vascular lesions and any kind of vascular abnormalities that often underlie the cortical defects. Yeah. Spectroscopy can show neuronal loss in um, regions that are affected, including the hippocampus. And diffusion and uh, diffusion MRI as well as functional MRI could help us illuminate those abnormal networks that may be involved in seizure propagation. And, and it is and I'll speak a little bit more about how epilepsy is increasingly being thought of as a network disease versus a focal disease where something only one small region is involved as a source. And so we'll dive into that. But first, I wanted to talk about our initial study that we performed here at Sinai, where we basically used a battery of imaging tests, including uh, uh, all of the sequences that worked very robustly at 7T, and that includes a susceptibility weighted imaging sequence. And we performed uh, imaging in 37 patients. Actually, it's increased in the 40s now. And all of these patients were chosen to be non lesional. They were patients who had epilepsy and focal seizures, but they were completely normal on their MRIs. So their EEG findings and clinical symptoms showed that there's something wrong and there was an, a sense of where it could be coming from and that's what we're calling the suspected seizure onset zone, um, but there wasn't a finding in MRI. And interestingly, we did find very clear abnormalities in the hippocampus as is shown here at 7T uh, for one of the non-lesional patients and a polymicrogyria, which is supposed to be a thickening of the cortex and a cauliflower appearance of the cortex in another patient, um, and a focal cortical dysplasia um, uh, in, in another patient where, again, it's pretty subtle, but was quite conspicuous in the, in the different types of uh, imaging that we did at 7T. And here's just a... a overall assessment of what we saw in the patient group versus controls. Patients are in blue, controls are in pink. And um, when we counted up the abnormalities, we looked at the frequency of findings in the hippocampus as well as the cortex. There was a much greater number of findings in the epilepsy group that was, as I'll remind you, non-lesional at their clinical field strengths. Um, and much fewer in the controls. We, we match these controls in, in gender and age just to make sure that we're not finding things that happen to become detectable at 7T and are not clinically significant. And we looked at all types of findings, clinically significant or relevant to epilepsy or not. And, um, and we've uh, really shown that all of those findings here. Um, 
as you can see, the hippocampal and cortical abnormalities were much greater in the patients versus the controls. Um, we also found, in, interestingly, a large number of uh, perivascular spaces. They're tiny little uh, fluid-filled spaces around vessels. And we found that they were asymmetric in epilepsy patients versus controls. Um, this was the first time these were noticed and maybe involved, uh, maybe uh, connected to inflammatory processes. But overall, um, when it comes to really just seeing a lesion or an abnormality that could help this patient's uh, treatment, we found in 25 out of those 37 patients at 7T, 15 of these were very likely localized and um, definitely um, connected to the suspected seizure onset zone. And seven of these contributed directly to the additional analysis that changed subsequent surgical intervention. And we, we have a paper coming out now on the outcomes for those patients, and there was a definite improvement in outcome after those abnormalities were uh, resected or, um, or targeted using neuromodulation. Um, we work with a team of epileptologists and neurosurgeons who work with us on integrating 7T data in a way that is um, above and beyond clinical standard of care, but informative. Um, and it, it really is quite um, promising as a additional non-invasive tool to help epilepsy patients. Here I'm gonna talk about, uh, as, I, as promised, the fact that we wanna also capture network abnormalities associated with epilepsy. Epilepsy is uh, really not actually just lo localized to one small focus. And in many epilepsies, there are um, other secondary foci or, um, or um, um, dual pathology that occurs where there is a focus in the neocortex, but there's also some abnormalities in the hippocampus. Uh, this needs to be better understood. How is the epileptogenesis, ep epileptogenic uh, tissue sort of being uh, um, arising in all of these different regions and how it is how relevant is it to seizure pro propagation and and whether or not it plays a role in the outcomes of these patients once the primary uh, seizure focus is identified and resected. But um, it is really uh, ripe for um, some of these network analysis tools that I was talking about earlier. And we are uh, going to be, we have already begun some of the diffusion and functional analysis to, to look for these networks. And so here's again that slide where we show the connectivity, how it's computed using whole brain diffusion and resting state, fMRI and graph theory analysis as, as well that we will be, that we're currently performing. And we take actually all of the different contrasts that we have, any kind of abnormality in the structural, functional, or um, diffusion characteristics and and we see how many of these voxels are a couple of standard deviations away from the group of healthy controls and it's a good way to identify uh, areas of the brain that just are abnormal in all types of modalities and communicate this information to the uh, epileptologist and on the right here we have this abnormality index showing areas of the brain that illuminated for this specific patient who had medial temporal lobe epilepsy and the hippocampus did light up, but there were also some other regions that were quite abnormal looking in the imaging. So we're doing more work on this uh, type of abnormality index um, uh, for amalgamated, mul amalgamated visualization of multiple modalities. Um, this is what the workflow is like, where we actually introduce 7T imaging during, um, uh, during case studies and, or, or during uh, case conferences. And we do a within subject control. So we'll perform uh, a treatment plan without the 7T data and then introduce the 7T imaging findings to determine whether there were any changes due to the 7T. This is something that we aim to do um, for patients moving forward so that there can be a very systematic way of evaluating the improvements due to 7T and then integrate this plan for potentially um, validation from stereo EEG or intracranial EEG, which will provide us with a gold standard 
of whether or not those regions of the brain are involved in seizure propagation. And then of course, perform post-surgical outcome analysis and look at the pathology of resected tissue. Um, I alluded to the stereo EEG earlier. These are very fine measurements uh, that are performed using electrodes that are implanted using burr holes in the skull. They are actually uh, less invasive than some of the other intracranial EEG uh, grids and uh, do not require craniotomy. And we want to use this as validation of some of our non-invasive imaging findings. As I said earlier, for skull-based tumors, we do an analysis on imaging markers or um, biomarkers, imaging biomarkers for our different disease conditions. And here is a analysis of subfield volumes in epilepsy. Interestingly, in our epilepsy set, we found that in the medial temporal lobe epilepsy patients who've had epilepsy for greater than 10 years, specific subfields, the CA1, CA2, 3, CA4, DG, and the subiculum, um, had a higher asymmetry between left and right than um, than uh, uh, in the in the other patient subgroups as well as controls. So uh, duration of the disease seems to be having an effect on these subfields, and um, and this is something that we are actually. Uh, in the process of publishing. We also found that connectivity, the subfield specific connectivity was affected in uh, these patients. And the on the on the ipsilateral side of the epilepsy, the CA1 subfield was uh, 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 was less connected, the subfield connectivity was less connected, and on, and we also found some findings on the contralateral side um, of, of uh, of uh, the seizure onset zone as well. So this has been published. Um, the perivascular spaces that I was talking about earlier that seem to be conspicuously high in um, epilepsy patients, we actually performed a analysis of this originally manually and, um, and this involved asking our student to actually uh, delineate each and every one of these tiny little white dots, which are those fluid-filled spaces. And um, that was a, kind of like a introduction to our lab is to spend hours and hours doing this. But now we have a automated uh, method to detect these perivascular spaces that we actually will publish soon and provide online. Um, they were different in epilepsies versus controls and were more asymmetric in ep epilepsy patients versus controls. We have some spec. Uh, we have some hypotheses as to why this may be the case. Um, you know, there is two or three reasons why these uh, perivascular spaces could be expanded. But one of the things is potentially um, an inflammatory marker of an inflammatory process. Um, and you know, something uh, related as a surrogate marker of glymphatic clearance. Um, so this is the final finding um, where we certainly uh, saw a difference in these markers. Um, so just wanted to pause and see if anyone had any questions on epilepsy. Okay, great. So I will move on to another application of high resolution multimodal imaging at 7T, and that is in the to understand the neurobiology of depression. So when we got started on this project, which is also an R1 funded project, we basically uh, worked with James Murrow. I, I, I worked with James Murrow on identifying what the needs were and trying to figure out the uh, imaging um, manifestations of the neurobiology of depression. And it turns out there are many different potential um, pathophysiological processes that could be leading to the symptoms of depression. And there really isn't much convergence uh, from what I've um, seen as to one being identified, one or two being identified as the main, uh, main reasons for depressive pathology. And of course, I'm uh, open to learning more about this since I'm not a psychiatrist, but as an imager, I basically um, found links to actual effects due to these 
potential pathophysiological um, um, mechanisms, and then how those effects could actually lead to changes in the structure or anatomy, as well as connectivity, as well as metabolite concentrations, and how we could detect those using MRI. And this is kind of like that um, thought process. Uh, what we do is we actually basically perform a battery of, neur uh, of neuroimaging tests uh, including spectroscopy, including hippocampal subfield volume uh, estimation, and including amygdala volume um, quantitative uh, analysis. And we also did, we also do analysis on connectivity. So we do diffusion MRI as well um, and functional MRI. Some initial findings are that amygdala. Um, subnuclei correlate with uh, depressive symptoms, uh, and this is a, st a published study on how the subnuclei, specific subnuclei of the amygdala, had a, a reduction in size when it came to the MADRAS score, um, and the, the, these survived um, correction for multiple comparisons. And um, we also performed hippocampal subfield um, connectivity analysis on uh, this uh, subset, patient subset, and found that with uh, uh, MDD onset, we saw a correlation of the dentate gyrus fibers. Um, so that was interesting. Um, and um, I wanted to point out that actually we didn't see a lot of findings that were group level findings between MDDs and matched controls, which was an interesting sort of overall learning experience that this is a heterogeneous disease. That's the reason we're trying to um, actually look at it in terms of disease severity and, and specific symptoms, maybe uh, look at the imaging markers of specific symptoms. So we've actually performed um, questionnaires that are specific to each symptom scale uh, in um, depression, so rumination being one of them, and anhedonia, and um, and then overall um, overall disease um, severity as well through through madras. Um, so um, we do perform correlative analysis analyses between all of our imaging findings and those uh, those symptom scales. And this again is the amygdala connectivity that I was showing you earlier. We found a lot of the, we can do, we can do connectivity, connectivity of specific amygdala nuclei. And we found that a few of the nuclei, the right amygdala nuclei were um, correlated with, um, with the depression severity as well. So that was uh, an interesting finding also published. Um, so this is, um, oh, actually these were, th these were actually group differences that we found between controls and MDDs. Um, this is work by Stephanie Brown and, um, she basically found that the streamline count from these right amygdala nuclei was different for, uh, MDDs versus controls. Um, and we performed graph theory analysis on the functional MRI data, found that, and this is, these are the steps in that analysis. Uh, uh, what we take is that functional connectivity matrix and perform, uh, lo look at different graph de densities and then look, uh, Yael Jacob, who has published this work, looked at um, the node strength. And um, this is a measure of how connected a certain node in the matrix, ma ma in the network is. And um, it was found that the precuneus had a very, very strong correlation when it comes to this node, um, uh, sorry, um, the uh, node strength measure with the rumination score. And, uh, and that also survived correction from multiple comparisons. And this work has been published as well recently. Um, so any questions on that portion of our work? <laughs>
Okay, I'll quickly wrap up. Um, I feel like during this time, there is obviously a need to understand um, the changes in, the, in all organ systems associated with COVID-19. And since we have this very, very um, sensitive and, and comprehensive tool set to understand changes in the brain, we have decided to apply these to understand the neurological manifestations of COVID-19. There are many ways in which COVID-19, the SARS-CoV-2 virus can affect the central nervous system. It can be through the uh, circulatory system. It can be through the nervous system, through the olfactory bulb, through the vagus nerve. Um, and uh, it can actually directly uh, infect the brain as well through the brain stem. And other coronaviruses have been shown to do that. There have been neurological uh, manifestations that have been reported in um, hospitalized patients in Wuhan, China, 36.4% had uh, neurological symptoms. Here at Sinai, Dr. Puneet Bulani found that there's an incidence, uh, there's a connection between the rate of stroke found in CTA scans and COVID-19. Um, COVID-19 necrotizing hemorrhagic encephalopathy has been found in patients who have a um, cytokine storm and have severe respiratory distress. And uh, other viruses in the past that are uh, coronaviruses, MERS and SARS-CoV-1, do show that they can actually infect the brain stem. So neurotropism is a characteristic of this virus. And these, uh, there are many centers in the brain stem that control respiration, so it could be connected to the severe respiratory uh, failure that we're seeing in patients. Um, 7 allows us to look at structures that are important to the symptom symptoms that we're observing in uh, COVID-19, such as anosmia or a loss of sense of smell. Here we have a uh, zoomed in image of the olfactory bulbs. Um, and we can look at the brainstem in great detail using our brainstem coil. Uh, but also we can perform qualitative and quantitative analysis of all brain structures um, that may be relevant to uh, the neurological symptoms, but also could be um, could be affected in uh, the rest of the brain um, due to other processes such as inflammatory processes. And we are actually performing this imaging on COVID survivors um, three months post their um, illness. So we we will be seeing effects that persist uh, at that time. Um, there's an ex vivo study happening in parallel by Dr. Alan Seifert. Oh, okay. So that is that for uh, the COVID-19 work. We're going to initiate that soon. I wanted to say that I never always got a chance to uh, indicate um, some of the lead, lead postdocs and staff scientists and students working on many of this these works, but it is all their work. And uh, the epilepsy, for example, led by Dr. Rebecca Feldman, who is now at uh, who is now at UBC in a faculty position. A lot of the work on uh, on depression uh, by Yale Jacob and Stephanie Brown and uh, Jack Rutland. Um, we have a lot of the skull based work ha happening and trigeminal neuralgia through. Um, uh, Jack Rutland and Judy Alper, Gore Verma working on a lot of the thalamic subnuclei segmentation as well as um, uh, technical development work and as well as 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 a uh, as, uh, um, MDD, um, oh, sorry, a major de depressive disorder. And, and that's not uh, complete, but I just wanted to say that they have done some amazing work and um, very happy to be showing their results to you uh, today. And I wanted to also thank my funding sources and my mentors and collaborators. So thank you very much. Thank you, Preet. Great talk. Uh, a handshake from online. Um, does anybody have any questions for Preet? Um, this is Yasmin. A quick question. Sure. Um, Preet, yeah, beautiful. I mean, it's amazing what you, the uh, this resolution can afford us. And, um, one of the things I was wondering about was the MRF. The resolution is great. And I wondered um, whether you have been able to really dissociate 
um, a number of the neurochemicals, such as glutamates, from GABA and so on, that you've seen relevant to any of the clinical cases that you have been um, investigating in different populations, because the MRS is definitely something, you know, that we all want to also come back to yes. in terms of neurochemical. In mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I did not show, um, so that, first of all, the, when it comes to the glutamate, glutamine, GABA type, um, metabolites they are they are the neurotransmitters are they exist in lower concentration but they also have very broad coupled peaks so the types of techniques required to really differentiate them are very uh, much more advanced and would have a probably have a lower resolution than the choline creatine and na that i showed but meaning larger voxel size but um definitely smaller than what one can do at 1.5 and 3T. And the stage of that work right now is in the finalization of the pulse sequences. And uh, Dr. Gaurav Varma is the person sort of um, heading, that, heading that right now. And I can show you actually um, some uh, findings that he recently, he actually sent me an email, so you're gonna have to go into my email here for a second, but, uh, uh, he's able to differentiate um, these metabolites. It's okay. You could also send. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you can also do it later. I know time wise. Yeah, but yeah. I can. You can send me. Yeah, you can send me. But okay. So you have been able. But to you can see it. these metabolites. You can see how uh, they're differentiated, and and their two D spectroscopy method that allows us to um, really sort of tease out these um, uh, uh, different neurotransmitters that are usually difficult to detect in a tr typical mm, yeah. scan. So basically it hasn't been applied yet to patients, but we plan to. We plan to integrate it in the next phase of all of our studies. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so I think given the hour, we should stop. Pre, thank you again so much for doing this. Thanks everybody. Uh, see you again next week. Bye-bye. Thank you.